This podcast is part of the Garnet Media Group Podcast Network. Garnet Media Group is a partnership between the student-run media outlets at the University of South Carolina. Find out more about Garnet Media's podcast and other student work at garnetmedia.org. Good morning, Gamecocks. I'm Chloe Finley. I'm Megan Douches. Chloe and I are back for the summer, giving you a recap on the news and happenings on the USC campus and around Columbia. Joining us this summer on the podcast are two producers, Caroline Smith and Delaney Flanagan. I'm Caroline Smith, and we hope you enjoy our summer podcast edition of Good Morning Gamecocks. And I'm Delaney Flanagan. This week, USC's College of Engineering is looking forward to a makeover. The Gamecocks are welcoming new coaches for the baseball and softball teams. The city of Columbia could be a little quieter as lawmakers plan to shush the city's trains. And the South Carolina State Museum right here in town unveiled a brand new exhibit. With that, we hope to get your weekend started in the right direction. Welcome to Good Morning Gamecocks. Welcome back, everyone. Happy Welcome podcast back. Podcast edition. Hey, hey guys. So, so happy excited to be, to be back. So excited for Delaney and Caroline to finally be in front of the camera because I feel like you guys have a lot to say anyway when you're behind the camera. I've been subtitling us for a few episodes. Yeah, I was going to say, it'd be nice not have to like go whisper or Live yell. In the background are the best part. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gamecocks, we've got some stories for you to kick off your weekend, starting with a change to a pretty important campus landmark. USC's <laughs> College of Engineering and Computing is looking forward to a rebrand after a $30 million donation to the school. Swearingen Engineering Center will become the Melina Rowley College of Engineering and Computing. Wow. That, that's a mouthful to say. I'm not even going to lie. That's quite people the name. Have been, people have been laughing about it on Yik Yak, which is kind of sad, honestly. He's a pretty accomplished dude. Yeah. No, he's, I mean, his resume is, it, it speaks for itself. He graduated from USC, the engineering school, back in the 80s. Uh, then became a CEO of a, like a air conditioning company, like a fire and air conditioning company. Um, and uh, he, fun fact, he oversaw the opening of the battery recycling plant in Florence. And he said it was the most innovative battery recycling operation in the world. So go Florence. Aren't you from Florence? I'm from Florence. Yeah, that's what I thought. So go (laughs) you. You have to to make a visit. I'll I'll ask some questions. Yeah, go check out the, (laughs) I'm sure it's quite the site, you know, up there with like the Eiffel Tower and, you know, the the pyramids of Egypt is that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But people are hating on this. They really don't like the new name. They changed it to, like, like you said, based on the donation, but I don't, this is not the first time he's donated to the college before. It just had I to. I wonder, like, what, what's the threshold? Like, how much do you have to donate to get, like, the name changed? I feel well, like it's donated. worth noting. It's worth noting that is, I put, like, 30 million is what's in the script, but it is 30.001 million dollars. Stop it. That's what it is. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that the threshold might be 30 million. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Guys, if we That's pull all our money, money together, the J School could be the, the Good Morning Gamecocks School of Journalism. <laughs> yes! We gotta get yes. out there, guys, start bringing in that money. <laughs> exactly. I you think know, we could... we're all, we already know that we are the best show ever on the ever to exist on the internet, but um, we just need to, to, I guess, make up $30 million first, and then we can have our moment. And we need to come up with a sick nickname, like Rolly Rolly with a dab of ranch. Yeah, what was with that? I read that on Yik Yak. I don't understand that at all. The memes on Tic Tac, t- oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Combining Yik Yak with Tic Tac, that is embarrassing. Um, but the people on Yik Yak are going off about this. The funniest thing I saw, it was the meme about the um, the budget actual i'm doing air quotes around budget and actual has been also air quotes leaked um and it involves like you know two dollars to buy a candy bar for president emeritus and donating the remaining 17.9 million to darla yeah i mean maybe i don't quite understand because i'm not an engineering student but i don't see why it's such a big deal that the name changed if it's the same thing right i mean i want to know what you guys think about it I don't know who's who who was Swearingen. I looked it up. So it was named the Swearingen School in 1987. Unsure who Swearingen is. I can fact check it. 
I've always been unsure how to say that right. So, I mean, we, we're just going from one spelling that freshmen can't pronounce to another spelling that freshmen can't pronounce. So is it anything that really is true? true. <laughs> it's because now the upperclassmen have to learn the new, the new <laughs> spelling. <laughs> John E. Swearingen, former <laughs> chemical engineering student, class of 1938. Oh. Okay, so it's just going uh, from one alumnus to another. Oh, uh, he says. The viewers at home oh. can't see this, but there's some serious Googling going on. <laughs> he was a like his eyes are like laser focused <laughs> in on this screen to figure out who Swearingen was. I think this is the same per. What did I say? 1938. He was a student. Yes. I mean, does anybody know the the importance of any of the names of our buildings? Like, who's Russell? For Russell House, is that a person? Uh, that's like, I'm pretty sure a pretty important person. I'm pretty sure, yeah. I feel like I, I remember learning about that in U101, but that was three years ago, so I don't remember exactly. <laughs> I do know McKissick is like one of the most known names from our school because he, he was a former president. He's buried on the horseshoe. On the yeah. horseshoe. Yeah. And he was a J, J school professor at one point or dean we I talked about that on a previous episode of good morning Game. we did. did yeah 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 but. all i have is that it was named after former usc chemical engineering student that's the most i could find from a pdf from the school so that was criteria for naming a building a while ago criteria for naming a building a graduate from the school and spend oh. 30 million point zero 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 one dollars on a donation and we can get the name of the building he went he went to school at to usc at 16 years old just yeah. like chloe just like you <laughs> just like chloe <laughs> chloe is it are we gonna soon be attending the chloe finley school of journalism and mass communication hey i didn't say it you did that's all i'm saying <laughs> that's like, all i'm saying was, that. you gotta yeah, exactly you gotta right? manifest it 30.002 million dollar donation yep yep <laughs> <laughs> just to just to one up them. I mean, the school of journalism doesn't have a name yet, so you could be the first. I you could. could we could all be the first. We could I don't know about that. Swearing, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a business bit of a student. I don't think I can update. replace. I can't replace Darla Moore. <laughs> <laughs> you won't know well, until you try. I I I, I I I read in the the Post and Courier article about this name change that part of the donation money is going to like creating a connection between the engineering students and the business students like melinda what's his name again Malin, Malin i can't pronounce it melinda roly melinda roly one of the things he wanted to do was like give the engineering students the practical skills that business students get and then vice versa with business business students getting like the technical skills that engineering students get so he wants to like open a program and like have a partnership with the two schools so do we see a Swearingen bro, Darla bro beatdown? I don't know. Is there going to be a boxing tournament between them? I don't know. We might have to make another bracket. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I don't understand it. Because, like, you know, business students have been saying, for, as, a, as a business student, uh, we've been saying forever that, like, it's kind of ridiculous that we're the only school on campus. It seems, at least to us, that we're the only school that professors are, like, pouring effort into us, teaching us how. How to, how to dress, how to perfect resumes, how to search out like jobs, like with serious help, not just encouragement. Yeah, and that's especially, I feel like important. I mean, it's important for all, all majors. Like you need to know how to present yourself to people. Like, we all have to find a job. Yeah, but I took a class on that. It was required. Yeah, that's crazy. I can't, I couldn't grad. It was a one credit hour class. So it wasn't all that much, but Business Administration 301 like has gotten me several jobs. <laughs> Wait, you took like an like an etiquette class in business school? I took a etiquette, resume, interviewing, personality types, professionalism class. No way. What's yeah. the what's the craziest thing you had to do in etiquette class? Um, I don't know about crazy. It was all pretty normal, but um I think like one of the coolest things I had to do was I had to do an informational interview with an industry professional of choice. So, I used one of my friend's mothers I like FaceTimed her and just had to record an hour-long phone call with me asking her about what she does and oh. learn about 
that. It was cool. Wow. So do you think your professor listened to every student's one hour phone calls? <laughs> um, no, probably not. But she, my professor was really <laughs> nice. And actually the professor of that class wrote me a, um, she wrote me a recommendation letter for a job that I still have. <laughs> so <laughs> That's awesome. I her. <laughs> she was great. <laughs> Yeah. Also, I do have a little update on swearing Jen. Oh no, Ooh. she found it. He, uh -oh. he was one of the giants of the American petroleum industry of the 20th century. He died in 2007. This is off of National Academy of Engineering's website. He had served Standard Oil Company in Indiana, which he became, he became uh, Amico's corporation as CEO and chairman on the board for 23 years. So he was with Amico as their chairman. He was also a member of Phi Beta Kappa, which I don't even think that that's a fraternity at our school anymore, which oh, is wow. interesting. So he was into big oil is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> interesting <Yep>. indeed. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, re regardless of the guy's pedigree, no one really likes this new name and it's it's gotten a lot of backlash. So. Is it that people don't like it or are they just like, are we bored because it's June and there's nothing else on campus to talk about? Oh, that so you think, you think we're just chatting about it because we have nothing better to do? I mean, I, I get that. Yeah, I think this would have flown completely under the radar in February. I yeah, that, that. that's mean, a good all, point. No one's yeah, well, the, the, law school, the law school's name got changed. Yeah, and that see, wasn't really like even a notice? big deal. No. <laughs> I think the law school wasn't as big as a deal because a lot of the students in the law school are mostly graduate students, not mm. bachelor students. And grad students aren't on Yik Yak. Not, not likely. Not as high. Not People like those students. There's also students. a smaller portion. People are still going to call it swearing okay. gin. Like, oh, they, they will. It'll take a few years. I think after you get that four years of a group of kids out, you know, it's kind of, mm -hmm. it kind of falls. So in four years... In. Melina Rowley, so you say it can have Melina his Rowley. can have his moment. Good for him. He 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 got it him. coming. <laughs> well, speaking of changes, university baseball hires Paul Mineri as new head coach. I can't help you with that pronunciation, dog. <laughs> <laughs> Is that not it? I don't know. Maneri I looked it up before. That's why I was um, <laughs> like a minute late to the call, actually. <laughs> Maneri. Maneri. Yeah. So, Paul Maneri, Gamecock Baseball, you know, they have been decorated in the past. Two national championship titles, 2010, 2011, multiple college World Series appearances, tons of NCAA conference, uh, conference appearances, and they have not been doing good since the Ray Tanner era. Ray Tanner is our athletic director now, and he was our formal, former baseball coach. Fired our former head coach of baseball, Mark Kingston, on June 6th. And Paul Maneri got hired on Tuesday, which is pretty exciting. He is a former LSU baseball coach, and he was the head coach there. He retired after 15 seasons with LSU. So he came out of retirement to come coach. Coach, Gamecock baseball. Pretty cool. Wow. I feel like USC keeps taking, we keep taking staff members from LSU because that's our parking director also came from there. So I don't know. <laughs> parking director? Parking, yeah, the parking <laughs> director also came from LSU, <laughs> which is so random. But like, I think it's like odd that so many of these like random people keep coming from LSU. To you know, I was school. scrolling on Instagram today and came across like the Alumni Association is launching a new line of merch. And one of them is a t-shirt that says, go Cox, like it always Cox. does, but the go yeah. is G-E-A-U-X, and it's like I a saw that. LSU shirt. That was I crazy. Saw that. I saw that, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, but Paul Maneri, <laughs> he coached, like I said, LSU 15 seasons. He won one college World Series, but in 2009. So that was way before Ray Tanner even won. So we'll see what he brings to, you know, the team. Hopefully he can at least rebuild it a little bit more. Board of Trustees approved his contract at Tuesday. On Tuesday, the meeting was at four, so sometime around that time. But yeah, I, I think it. I think it'll be exciting to see um, a new a new head coach in baseball. I think our our students are pretty passionate about Gamecock baseball, 
And I think I think having a new head coach might bring a little bit more passion especially if it went in a bit went in a little bit more I hope so our field is so nice it's a shame that the team hasn't really been all that good because Founders Park is so beautiful and has a capacity to give an awesome game day experience to a whole lot of people yeah and South Carolina can be really good like they've produced MLB level not what no not even MLB level they have produced MLB players so they were once good. Hopefully they're... I didn't go to a, a baseball game last semester, which is really, like, my own fault, but they were I losing like anyway, so... <laughs> yeah. I, I honestly... this I'm a big baseball fan. I have not been to a single Gamecock baseball game, and I regret it every season. Every season, no I'm way. like, I'm too busy. And then, yeah. Wait, aren't you going to or- be, like, a junior or senior? Like, in... Junior. You're going to be a senior, and you've never been to a baseball game? You have one more shot, dude. One more, more season. Game. Yeah, come on. Oh, now, trust maybe. me. I'll, I'll be going. I'll be going to baseball. Especially if I can get myself a hot dog. I mean, what can I do? We are <laughs> I think, we're like 19 minutes in to the episode. I think, we might have to quickly, <laughs> I think we might have to quickly clear up the Megan Douch's hot dog lore for <laughs> potentially new podcast listeners. Like a big recap. <laughs> big recap. Let's. What are the top Megan hot dog moments? I mean, the, the mid mid cold cheese, cheese on a mid dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's not cold. It's warm. It's not- you you no, no, no. you said cold. You said you said cold. you would take shredded someone cheese. Someone throw in the receipts. Someone throw in the receipts. I did not say cold. <laughs> no, oh wait, wait, wait. You said you would take shredded cheese out of the fridge and put it on a hot dog. That is cold That's cheese. Hot. Cold cheese. <laughs> on like a mid-temperature hot dog. Cold cheese on a mid-dog. Cold <laughs> cheese on a mid-dog. I don't, think, I don't think you can go... I don't think you can go, you know, a couple hours without mentioning hot dogs. I mean, you even post hot dogs on, like, your Instagram story. Like, that's to crazy. Fair, I send <laughs> Megan hot dog content on Instagram all the time now. I, you do all the time. <laughs> And anytime I see hot dog content, I send it to Chloe and Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just so funny. I sent a picture once of um a the the wiener dog mobile, but I think it was like miniature. Oh, I think it was miniature. And Chloe was like, "I hope I see you you driving that around campus." And you know what? Maybe one day when I have enough money to name a building after me, I will be. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the, Megan, Megan, the Megan Douch's hot dog museum? <laughs> I mean, only if I'm like creating my own company. <laughs> Framed on Dou- the wall. Douch's dogs. You can call it that. Douch's dogs. Oh my that's god, that's actually, actually pretty cool. cool. That's what I'm saying. I can have my own restaurant. Framed yeah. photos. I of mean, all the Instagram <laughs> posts line the walls to the C-suite. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, forget the communications. I'm gonna own a hot dog business. Well, yep. speaking of speaking of that, while we're on the topic of that, we had a headline come in on Tuesday. Joey Chestnut will oh, yes. not be in the contest this year. The hot dog, the Fourth of July Nathan's hot dog contest, and the reason is is he signed with Vegan Hot Dogs, the Impossible brand hot dogs. So, how do you guys feel about what that? What are your thoughts? And yeah, I think you I need mean, to be the one to yeah, speak. You're on invested this. in this. I mean, I was pretty shocked when I first saw the headline. I think I got it from WIS TV and I, I saw it and I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean he's not, you know, eating like at the hot dog contest? Like, what? what? Like, because he dominates every year for I don't even know how many years. I, I would just say I'm pretty shocked, but I also had absolutely zero that he signed with a vegan hot dog bread. So yeah, it's just a little foreign to me. Like, it's like, it's like the NBA existing without Michael Jordan. Like, that, yeah. can, the, can the hot dog eating competition exist without Joey Chestnut? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't watch anybody else. It's just yeah. Joey. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Camera is I usually didn't know who this person me. was until I met Megan. Stop it. Did you not grow <laughs> up watching the hot dog eating competition on the 4th of July? No. Sad childhood. I didn't even know there was one. <laughs> I've only watched that's it a crazy. Few times. I haven't watched it's the American classic. I just know. That is, that's like 
That is an American classic. Yeah, no, I did not know this was a thing. You're from North Carolina. How have you missed out on this? That's like a I don't know. <laughs> Neither of my parents are from North Carolina, so maybe that's what it is. But I will. Well, that I guess doesn't give you an excuse, I'll watch Delaney. Past ones <laughs> from 2004 oh till till now. I'll watch all the ones I missed. That's so funny. <laughs> marathon, the hot dog, the hot dog marathon. I think I'll throw up. It's gonna make you sick because. It's not delightful to watch. It's so oh, like disgusting. Disgusting. throw up. Yeah, gross. and they like soak them in yeah. water first to like make the bread easier Ugh. to eat. It's gross. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We're, we're, Anything... we're grossing out Delaney. Start talking yeah. about the softball coach. All right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> next softball game, you'll be having a hot dog while you watch new USC softball head coach, Castine. Um, she just got hired. She's a former Gamecock alumni, which is great. I love to see her alumni coming back to our school. She coached for, well, first of all, Ray Tanner fired Beverly Smith, softball head coach of 14 years. Um, so I think it's a pretty big deal. Her Smith uh, career went 461 to 323. So pretty well most Wayne coach in the SEC program history, but I think that probably falls under her being in that position for so long. Uh, 14 years, I think you can rack up, you know, those wins pretty fast, plus softball wins are, there's more games in the season than compared to football. So, but we got our former Gamecock, Ashley Chastain, coming back. She uh, played 2009 to 2011. She has been a pitching coach in the past at Michigan State and Ole Miss. And then she was head coach at UNC, Char- University of North Carolina, Charlotte. She's the first USC alumni to be named a head coach since Boo Major, who was named head coach in 1998 of the equestrian team. So it's been a while since we've hired an alumni back in a coaching position or a head coach position. I think this is pretty cool. I- I'm pretty excited for this one. She won she, her, the first season, her first season at Charlotte. They won more games than they ever had in program history. So oh. that shows how that boosted their program. Yeah, that should be really good for them. Um, I will say the one thing that's sad about Coach Smith is that she always brought her dog everywhere. Um, she had this <laughs> little, I think it was, she just had this little, like, scruffy little dog. And everywhere she went, he would just run around without a leash. So if you'd go to, like, a softball game, like, I've done, like, some stuff with Gamecock Live Productions for the softball games. And so, like, when you get there early, the dog's just running around, and all the players are running around. <laughs> it's, like, a lot. That is awesome. So that will be missed. That is really cute. Yeah. It's those, it's those yeah, coaches so- that bring that, that, that little bit of joy in life. She might not... I mean, she did have a, a winning record, but, you know, I guess it's time to hang up the... Hang up the... The coaching whistle, as some might say. <laughs> yeah, I mean her. I I I would say that forty six four hundred sixty one to three twenty three. There, there's not a you know what I mean. It's not like it's a super vast difference. Um, yeah, it's like not a not too dra- drastic of a you know wins to losses. So I think it was time to have a new coach, and I mean. Fire the baseball coach, might as well fire the softball coach too and bring in new. We got the whole new staff in for um all all spring spring batting games. <laughs> yeah, we will have to we'll have to pull up to a, a couple of them because we'll be interested. I'm, I'm excited to see how, how the coaches do because I know like when Beamer first came, it was a big deal. Granted, our football program was huge, but um I think pretty I know people are pretty excited about the LSU when I know softball isn't as much watched by the students. Um, but people still pay attention to the scores, and I think we'll be paying attention to those scores a little bit more this year because I think we'll be doing yep. some winning. Woohoo! Hopefully. Yep. yep. All yep. right. Although train noises are a staple of Columbia life, lawmakers have been trying to stifle the sounds for the past seven years. Um, and they had a meeting this past week, and they're finally trying to enact their plan that establishes these quiet zones for trains in Columbia. The need for these quiet zones kind of started because a bunch of people were complaining to the city of Columbia about the noise, which I think like if you're living by train tracks, isn't that the point of Columbia, South Carolina, like 
Like, aren't the trains legally required to, like, scream as they approach cities so that people can't be like, well, I didn't hear the train coming. And then they get hit by the train and they sue the railroad company. And the train's like, bro, there's no way you didn't hear it coming. I thought that was the point. (laughs) Well, yeah. So, okay. So, context. In 2005, um, the train horn rule was passed because and it made it so that trains had to sound their horn, like, within 15 to 20 seconds before they actually, like, crossed into an intersection. So, um, it just made it, you know, made it safe for everybody. You could hear the train coming, especially because a lot of intersections in Columbia don't have the little like bars that come down. That's like, true. I feel like, well, yeah. I think they yep. just better, but which is so scary. Better. And like being a pedestrian in Columbia is already terrifying. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. especially when you're waiting for the train to go and you're just like looking at it, like, whoa. <laughs> but what you're like, I yeah. don't. What I don't understand is that if there's no railroad crossing, like, sign, posts, levers, the things that come down, mm-hmm. if there's none of those and there's no sound, what are you are you just supposed to just, like, like, what what are the measures that they're going to take to make sure Do it's still safe? Do you think they would safe? put them in, in place of, so if the horn's not going, they'll, ha- they'll add them to those sections that don't have the things? Yeah, so um, basically they are just try- going to like compensate with like major safety measures. So they're working with the, um, they're like trying to upgrade things for ADA compliance, like American Disability Act, um, for the mats, which are the little like bumpy things. You know, when a sidewalk is ending and there's the yeah. wheelchair access, there's the bumpy mats, mm-hmm. just to know like, hey, you're coming up on something. Um, but they're also going to do like a bunch of sidewalks, which... I don't know. Um, but also just a bunch of signage so people know that like the train isn't gonna make noise. And I think also like the blinking lights and the um the lever thing that goes up and down. And they're basically just gonna try and use those things to supplement the train horn, which I don't know. Like I kind of feel like like say somebody with who's like blind is walking and they walk into the train and the train doesn't make noise, like how are we gonna <laughs> How do you yeah. supplement that? Like, that's a lot. I do uh, know that some of the crosswalks that have those things that come down have, like, bells. So it'd be a different, like, level of noise. Mm-hmm. Um, So, it, you know, it's not as loud as a train horn reaching further out in the city. It would just be, like, the bells that, that ring. And that would be good for, I guess, people nearby if they if they implemented those into their systems. Yeah, absolutely. But basically, or- just, like, in a, in a meeting last Tuesday, they are trying to secure $1.8 million to basically start the project and start implementing all this stuff and creating the sidewalks and the mats and all of the signage for it. So we'll see. <laughs> Call I do think, be honest. like good timing on this is that, um, well, I don't know if you could say it's good timing. This is kind of a, this is a little bit of a dark humor piece, but referring back to the oh, Yik no. Yak posts about the Molina <laughs> Rolling School, uh, the, the quote unquote leaked actual budget joke y'all have got to go look this up but a portion of the budget is dedicated to paying off bribing city officials in Colombia to shut up the trains and to take away all of the railroad crossing things call it the quiet zone and do not tell the drivers <laughs> mm-hmm. oh my gosh that's crazy <laughs> I'm like that's I mean just because the train tracks do run like right by Swearingen like imagine how disrupting that has to be if you're in class so maybe a quiet zone would benefit like students in the middle of the day yeah, no, they're, like, they're trying to create, like, I think they're trying to create 14 of them, and they go from Gadsden Street to Beltline Boulevard. So, literally, like, that's a long all way. over Columbia, like. But that, to me, like, that's, that area, it seems like it would be that, like, Hollywood Rose Hill, like, where mm-hmm. there's, there's, like, neighborhoods back there, and, you know, Campus Village yeah. is, like, right up against the train tracks. hmm I will be honest, this might be, like, the hottest hot take ever. I kind of like the trains in Colombia. I like hearing them. It it reminds you of Colombia. You know when it, like I go home and I'm like I hear I hear the you know NJ Transit train all anyone's every once in a while but like you know the trains are part of Colombia like it's known for that. Like well the city also was built on having train exports. I mean if you've ever read the some of the history about Colombia it's like part of our history. So why are we getting rid of our, like <laughs> the noise? Well call me crazy Plus safety. Call me crazy, but I have never heard a train. I have never seen a train. 
in, in Colum- I mean, I've heard a train before. It, I'm talking about in Colombia. I have never seen <laughs> or heard a train while being That's in Colombia. I've crossed the tracks once, but I've never. I've never. Were heard you in one. West Campus? Like. No, I was like I. I think well, I lived in the main like right on Green Street. Mm. But. You were you were in Capstone, right? No, I was in I was in Women's Quad. Oh my god, I knew that. <laughs> yeah. Wait, um, really? Because I used to be able to hear the train from South Tower my freshman year. I heard no. the trains from my freshman year dorm. I lived in an honors freshman year. They never like woke me up or anything, but I could hear them. Yeah. And I, yeah, the, I like, never behind trains on the tracks and well, the, I'm with, the I'm with, railroad arms. I'm with Megan on this because I also like at home now, like I'm from like the, the Raleigh area, but I literally live. I can walk to the train station, like the Amtrak station in my hometown. So I'm so close to train tracks at home. And I also lived in an apartment that was right next to the train tracks in Columbia. And I just never like, I feel like you get used to it. Like it never. Yeah. It, it kind it of walks was, out it's, it's also never way. loud enough to call and complain. Like that's also kind of shocks me about this because people are like calling. Like that's crazy to me. It only yeah, goes wonder, like how many horns. Where are these people? Like, what? It makes sense if you, like, imagine those of you who know the way Columbia is laid out, like, imagine the way that, like, imagine living at the lofts and, like, you're in this old yeah. building and, like, rattles when the train goes <laughs> right by you and blows its horn going two miles an hour at four o'clock in the morning. Like, that has got to get old. I feel like no amount of getting used to it will stop you from waking up because of that. And that's just not necessary in the middle of the night. Mm hmm. I do know, though, that, like, the train's blaring its horn the entire time it's driving through Columbia. It, it blares its horn, I believe, like, it, there's a certain set amount of times they're supposed to, you know, blow the horn before they cross an intersection. So, you know, it might be, like, three to five, but it stops. But that that track across assembly is, like, I, I, I would say in Columbia the most used track. Mm-hmm. There's a track across Assembly Street? There's at least four between campus and the stadium. If you are so you many. Live long enough, you learn how to avoid them. But you can avoid all four of them if you know like, how the, to drive. Um, Blossom Good. Street. Wild. I always go past Swearingen to get, or past Lofts or Swearingen to pass the Assembly Street one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So a train that like crosses Whaley Street. Mm-hmm. Okay, I clearly, I clearly do not know where these these train no, tracks and I are. also like I used to walk from Capstone my freshman year to the Starbucks and Five Points RIP because I used to work there <laughs> Five Points. but one time I was like when I would come home getting stuck behind the train when I just wanted to go home back to my dorm after I'd opened the store at like 4 a.m like that's like the saddest image ever I love trains I'm like imagining you getting stuck behind a train on foot walking home <laughs> <laughs> That is so. I had it last like two hours, and I was like, "All right." <laughs> even scarier is people hopping trains because that could be very dangerous. It's so dangerous. we get that a lot. Then people with our like get so impatient. Yeah. Whoa, wait, wait, hold on, time out. People are people will climb over a moving train instead of waiting for they're it. They are. They go very slow. Really? Well, when they're oh. when when trains are moving through like five points, they're going. They're going really, really slow. But no matter, yeah. you st- you should not like the train cannot. You should not up. hop a moving vehicle. No. Yeah, do that. Even if it stops, don't do that. Because if it just takes off, you know what's gonna happen? You're going for a ride. Like <laughs> <laughs> it might be the last ride you ever go for. <laughs> but oh my goodness, yeah. Disclaimer from the Good Morning Gamecocks crew to all of you listeners out there: Do not hop trains. <laughs> We do not. Don't have trains. And maybe we'll see some more quiet trains in Columbia. Maybe we'll have a quieter city when we come back. And, like, part of me thinks that that sounds kind of nice. I think it could be nice. Yeah. I think it'd be, well, it'd be a different um, tone. It's only different. I don't know. I kind of think I'm team train on this one. I don't know. I can't explain me why. Me too. It's just as like, I just, I think we should just leave them alone. There's other things we need to be. We could be doing. <laughs> there's something... There's something sort of funny and obnoxious about an old, <laughs> rusty, two-mile-an-hour train just just pulling the train whistle as hard as it can for a just very like, long time. Just honking. Finding its own business, causing a scene for no reason. You know, it almost feels like it adds some personality. Yeah. You know? 
I agree. As one of SGTV's training directors, I'm a big fan of trains. As you should. <laughs> Training directors, when when training starts, we have like literally like wi- like wooden train whistles that we blow to get the trainees' oh, attention. Dude. So yeah, and I was it you that I tried to like use it once and you like yanked it. Was that you? Yeah, yeah I, don't take that. Yeah, you were very protective over your train whistle. I was like, okay, <laughs> sorry, my bad. Always trainer. <laughs> all right well <laughs> moving on from the train tracks um if you're like me and of the four of us i'm the only one who's in columbia this summer so if you're bored like me in columbia uh consider stopping by the south carolina state museum to take a look at a new exhibit that just opened up um this, just this past weekend on june 8th the museum unveiled a new exhibit called shared sacrifice south carolina in world war ii the exhibit delves into the stories of South Carolina men and women who contributed to the war effort in some way, in all kinds of ways, especially the contributions of black South Carolinians who had to fight like a war on two fronts because they were fighting overseas and they were fighting for civil rights back at home. This is the 40s. Things were not good for most people in South Carolina at the time. So some really cool features of the exhibit, things that are on display for you to look at. Um, a whole lot of uniforms, like Red Cross nurse uniforms, military uniforms, of course, and a uniform of a man named Ernest Henderson Sr., who was a member of the esteemed Tuskegee Airmen. If you remember from your U.S. history class, they were pretty, they were they were awesome. They did a lot of really difficult stuff. Um, he was from Lawrence, South Carolina. Another thing on display is a holiday card that was mailed from a soldier named Jack Williams. Um, He was the first native resident of Columbia to uh, lose his life in World War II. And the holiday card that he sent was mailed from Pearl Harbor to Columbia, South Carolina. And he died shortly after the attacks on Pearl Harbor. Also featured are more uniforms and, of course, all kinds of military equipment. So any, any history buff should definitely head over there to feast their eyes on everything that's on display. And while we're on the topic of World War II, the South Carolina State Museum Planetarium, that's right, there's a planetarium. If you didn't know that, you should go watch a planetarium show because so they do a really cool. good job. It's so cool. It's Are you kidding me? We have a planetarium in this town. So the planetarium's uh, one of the new exhibits they have going on is a showcase on how the moon played a role in the planning of D-Day. Because if, you, if you're, again, harken back to your U.S. and European history classes to think about the storming of Normandy Beach. It happened really, really early in the morning. So lighting was really important. It was dark. You had to know how much or how little light were you going to have. And it was a beach. So being able to predict the tides was pretty imperative to figure out how the attack was going to go. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really cool. cool. I, didn't know that. I haven't seen it yet, but I can't wait to see it. I think what's cool about that is someone had to realize. Someone years later had to realize, oh, they probably, you know what? They probably used the moon when they when they did that. You know, let's no, I mean, let's, let's investigate take, that. That's, it didn't that's take insane. time to like have to investigate it. Like lunar astronomy was like actively used at the time to plan. No but, way, really. That's true. Yeah, that's what the, that's what this is about. Like oh. the planning, the planning of Operation Overlord was. It was it was so in depth. Actually, I I don't know how much time we have for me to ramble on about this spy <laughs> whose story I got so invested in on Wikipedia just a couple minutes ago. But yeah, the planning of Operation Overlord was it was very in depth, and they spent months and months and months on this. It's like this was their no shot, idea. and they they so had to cool. do it well. So um, while we're on the topic of D Day, if you'll indulge me and let me tell you the story of a Spanish born man who's given the alias of Garbo, who was a spy during World War II and was pretty vital in the success of D-Day at the time. So Garbo's actual name was Juan Pujol Garcia, and he was from Barcelona. Um, He begrudgingly fought in the Spanish Civil War when he was young, and this turned him into like because of that, he hated totalitarianism and just came to absolutely abhor the Nazis and everything that they were doing. And he uh, reached out to the German military. and He was like, hey, can I be a spy for y'all? And they were like, no, we don't know who, we, what are you talking, we don't know who you are, get out, stop it. And he was like, okay. So then he <laughs> figured out a way to trick all of these governments into thinking, it's like 
that he was some sort of fanatic. He did it through like the Spanish embassy and tricked the Germans into thinking that he actually was on their side. He got into spying. He was just some guy working out of a library and the German military fully thought he was a complete double agent, thought he was stationed in London. He was just feeding them completely fake information. It was real information. It was true because he was reading it in newspapers and sending it to them late because news at the time was bad. <laughs> so they forgave him for being behind on everything. And after a couple months of this, it's ludicrous. Um, but after a couple months of this, the, um, the, allied powers, you know, the United States and the British armies began to realize, hey, this guy, we should be his friend. So they took him on, the British army took him on. And over the course of the, the rest of the war, Garbo came to manage an imaginary spy network of up to 27 fake people. And he was just spoon feeding the Germans a combination of fake information and real information that was delayed. You've got to be kidding me. I'm not That's kidding you at all. This actually happened. And That's so cool. In, in the months leading up to D-Day, which happened in June, so starting in like January of that year, he's like, send, he's contacting the German military officials like four to 10 times a day to feed them pieces of information. And he is wholeheartedly convincing the German military that the allies are going to attack in the Strait of Dover, which is like over 200 kilometers away from Normandy Beach. And he's got them just completely convinced on this. The British army is setting up a fake encampment on their side of the Strait of Dover to convince the Axis powers in France that this is where the attack is going to happen. And partly because of this misinformation that Garbo has been telling the German military for years that is part of the reason why the Axis powers were so unprepared for D-Day. And in I fact, think... on D-Day, at about three o'clock in the morning, Garbo sent a final transmission to the German military to tell them exactly what was going to happen. They did not see it until eight o'clock the next morning after the battle had happened, at which point he responded to them saying, what is this quote? It su it's such a baller quote. He says, I cannot accept excuses or negligence. Were it not for my ideals, I would abandon the work. Okay. He's blaming these people that he's lying to for not showing up to the battle that he told them not to show up to. Huh. Garbo I think what surprises me, I think what surprises me more than the details of the story is how you remembered all of the details of that story. <laughs> I'm like actively looking at multiple like articles about it while i'm reading it to you like i'm giving I, but i have i watch i've watched a whole documentary on this y'all like this story oh did you here. watch the um the garbo the spy one no i did not actually that's not no. the one i'm talking about but i was looking it up while you're talking so i was like somebody's probably made a movie about this and it didn't look like oh, there yeah. was one there was just one documentary yeah well he's generally renowned to be the greatest double agent of the second world war and uh at the conclusion of the war he was awarded um he was given awards by by both sides. He was given the Iron Cross from the German military, as well as being named a member of the Order of the British Empire. This is essentially the equivalent of the Medal of Honor from both the British and the German militaries. Wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Garbo. He's a pretty sick guy. And that was... Yeah, so I have no idea if the South Carolina State Museum will tell you anything about him. Seems unlikely that the South Carolina Museum will tell you the story of a guy from Barcelona, but still cool to know. <laughs> yeah, that is really cool. Given that we just think, commemorated, what is it, the 80th anniversary of D-Day? Yes, it was 80th. Wow. Yeah. I don't know if you guys saw on ABC World News, David Muir did like a whole story with um, former veterans that were at D-Day and are still alive. There's very little of them left and he you know went to their homes talked about what some of them were doing still some were going to you know high schools middle schools talking about what they did and then some were just one was you know still working on building his planes and stuff that he used to love to do they he they took them all on to normandy beach for that 80th anniversary and they got to see it you know for the first time in, in 80 years and the biggest thing with with dj was a lot of them don't talk about they didn't talk about it for years and years so you know having them telling their story to us now I think is really cool and I mean even that you know that story being put into the South Carolina Museum is awesome yeah that's really beautiful 
I saw another story about it was a, a veteran from D-Day and he like got married. He was like he's like a hundred I think he's a hundred years old. Yeah, I saw that one too. Married. Did you see that? And it and they got married like at the they got married like in the Normandy Beach area, like at the memorial where everybody was buried because he was like, I wanted my friends <laughs> to just like see what how like what happened and everything it was very sweet it was very cute well that for all you awesome. self-professed history nerds in south carolina obviously there's a lot to examine at the state museum and if you want more information about garbo hit up caroline because yeah apparently, apparently she knows everything this story but um yeah go see, there's all sorts of exhibits in addition to this at the south carolina state museum it's a columbia staple if you haven't been to it yet admission to the museum is usually 13 dollars, but if you're like me and you go on the first sunday of the month it's only a buck look so, at that that's take awesome. a dollar sunday I gotta, I gotta take advantage of that that sounds fun yeah yeah well It's almost the end of our first podcast episode, but this wouldn't be Good Morning Gamecocks without a fun food fact. So what you got for us, Megan? All right. So this is pretty cool. one. So the creator of Pringles, Frederick Bauer, he, I think Caroline, (laughs) I think you guys know where this is going. I think you guys guys seem like you know where this is going. So he, he, um, he requested when he passed away that his children would bury part of his remains in the iconic Pringles can. And and his children fulfilled that wish and they did put him in a Pringles can and, and bury him. Stop with it. Him. I knew this I, as soon as you said Pringles, I was like, she's gonna talk about the cremation of this guy in a Pringles can. <laughs> That's so funny. I shouldn't laugh about that. That's very disrespectful. Thank you for inventing Pringles. I personally I love Pringles. I love Pringles. I love Pringles. That's that's next one of the best chips out there. Snack. That's, that's crazy. Have you I mean, seen he also the, the... created a company that's still being all around today. Yeah. Have you seen the Pringles Crocs? Please tell me you guys no. have seen the Pringles Crocs. The... It's Crocs with like a side compartment on your like outside ankle that can hold a whole can of Pringles. It's like high heels. It no, up. they're just regular Crocs with like. Actually, it might be in your toe. I forgot where it was, but there's a space. Oh, on I see the croc. them. I Whoa. think there's a space on the Blue clock that has right like space boots. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Oh my god, they do look like space boots. They look like you'd they walk on the yeah. them. Yeah. That's crazy. They look like those pair of boots from uh, Back to the Future. <laughs> That's what they remind me of. Oh my god, in yeah, the well, back of some of these Crocs is a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Well, yeah, we had the, the creator of Pringle. Doing a very iconic thing um, on his behalf um, after he was gone, but his legacy still lives on. I love seeing people get their final wishes honored. I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's great. Well, with that, we wrap up Good Morning Gamecocks for today, June 14th, 2024. As always, be sure to follow us on Instagram, X, and Facebook at SGTV at USC. To keep up with all of our content, be sure to also visit us online at SGTV at USC.com. For SGTV, I'm Delaney Flanagan. I'm Chloe Finley. I'm Megan Dauksheth. And I'm Caroline Smith. From all of us here at SGTV, have a great weekend, Carolina. Forever to be.